Welcome everybody, I'm Pat Martinez, President and CEO of Leadership in the Cloud. You're joining us here for Cloud Chat. We've been away, but we're back. And we're glad that you took the time to be with us here today. Do want to tell you that we'll be recording this and we have not only our guest speaker today, but people joining us, they'll be uh, giving us questions in chat. If you want and you have a question for us, please send it to us and we'll give it to our guest speaker. So before we go on, um, Leadership in the Clouds is a management consulting firm located here in Charlotte, but we have a national footprint. If you want to know more about what we do at the end, you can just visit our website. But I do want to introduce one of my coworkers, my colleague, part of the C-suite. We, we are women running the Leadership in the Clouds. And one of the members is Rashawn Peek. Rashawn, thank you for joining me here as my co-host. Why don't you take a moment and introduce yourself and tell everybody what you do at Leadership in the Clouds. Great, good afternoon, Pat. Good afternoon, uh, Reverend Mack. Um, welcome everyone that is attending today. I am happy to be in the clouds um, once again. Uh, my name is Rashawn Peek. I am the Chief Marketing Officer and Digital Strategist for Leadership in the Clouds for almost uh, six months now. Um, we are transforming leaders and connecting people with opportunities to find out how they can best um, suit their organizations and their small businesses. So looking forward to learning more about the participants here and connecting you with some excellent resources and a great conversation. Well, thank you. Rashawn is amazing. She keeps us navigating the clouds. Uh, we have been in the clouds for many years, and I don't want to tell you how long I've been in the clouds, but it used to go back to the days where you used to hear dial-up on, on the computer. So I'm really grateful to have my team, my other team member that you do not see, but you see her name on the screen, but we brought her over to say hello, is Nydia LeBron. She's our chief development officer, and we have several transformational leaders joining us. We are really blessed today to have our guest speaker, Reverend Corinne Mack. But before I introduce her, I want to give you a little bit of information about the NAACP. Many people may know, but I just want to just make sure that we're, we're abreast of what they do and how long they've been around. So I want to just read some information to you, with you, share, and then if you need more information, welcome you to go to the website. You know, the NAACP has been around since 1909. It's the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization. Its membership is throughout the United States and the world. You know, when you talk about the vision of the NAACP, we remember that it's called the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, it is to ensure a society in which all individuals have equal rights and there are no racial hatred or hate, racial discrimination. NAACP mission statement, the mission of the, and the National Association of the Advancement for Colored People is to ensure the political education, social and economic equality of rights for, of all people to eliminate uh, racial hatred and discrimination. They have a mission to ensure across six pillars, which I found extremely exciting for me, of uh, civic engagement, environmental and climate justice, federal advocacy, health, and economic opportunity, and criminal justice. Our guest speaker today is president of the National Association of Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, here in Charlotte, Mecklenburg, ca uh, the county branch number 5376. Reverend Mack and I know each other, and I can actually say that, you know, we're kindred spirits in many ways, but a brief overview Besides being the president of the NAACP chapter here, she's a retired rapid transit uh, operator from NYC, for those of you that are on the call today. Uh, she's also a former Charlotte Clergy Coalition co-chair of racial and economic justice. Her full bio will be on our website. But also, I just want to share that she is part, she was the chairperson of the North Carolina Black Leadership Caucus PAC committee. She was, she is the former president of the Charlotte A. Philip Ra uh, Ran Randolph Institute, can't read all of a sudden, the minister director of Nassau Correction Facility, and Nassau is probably in New York. Um, she has over 45 years of advocacy and uh, fighting for equity, quality, and justice. She spanned her experience across civil uh, workers' rights, civil rights, environmental justice, she has worked in DC. She's an 
ordained minister since 1982. We are blessed to have her in our community. But one thing that I really find exciting to share with you, she is a proud mother of three children, five grandchildren, and one great grandson. You know, how, you know, how, how does she find the time? She is blessed in so many ways. And lastly, to my excitement, she was born in NYC in Harlem, USA. She has been in Charlotte since 2007, and she kicked off her involvement in our community immediately. Welcome, 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 Reverend Corinne Mack to Cloud Chats. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am so um, excited to be here today and share with everyone who's part of this conversation. And that's what this will be, a conversation. And so um, you're a open and welcome to ask me any questions. I am as transparent as transparent can get. As my pastor says, I'm truthful to a fault. <laughs> Gets me in trouble. So, you know, when you, when you say that you're honest, um, that is not to be taken lightly. You are very transparent and you say what you mean and you stand by with action and words. I try, um, you know, I'm as honest as any human, can, any human being can be, but my belief is that when we're truthful with one another, we build a strong foundation of trust. You know, trust is something that we have um, little of. Some days are harder than others for people to, of different backgrounds and different persuasions to come together and build that trust. But I wanted to kick off our conversation with you. First of all, I will call you Reverend Mack, uh, even though I know you as Corinne. Um, I feel better that way, so I hope you, you'll allow me that. Um, I want to read something to you that is a little bit kind of, um, it's a statement that I, that I read here that I, that I found. It says, social justice means that everyone's human rights are respected and protected. That sounds pretty good. Everyone has equal opportunity. This does not guarantee that society will be perfect and that everyone will be happy. However, everyone will have a fighting chance at a life they want. They are no, not held back by things out of their control, like systemic obstacles or discrimination. That last sentence, a little disturbing to me, because a lot of put together the words justice and equality, which are two different concepts. And I wanted to ask you, you know, why do they pair them together and what's the difference? Um, I think for most people, they think it sounds good. And it probably does to, to folks who don't get it. But um, being a 63-year-old Black woman living in a country that has been founded on racism and systemic racism, we will never be equal until we deal with equity. And, and that's the issue. Equal um, means to have equal access, right? But the Black people have more than 400 years of being oppressed. So we could never be equal. I don't use the word equal. I use the word e equity more than anything else. Because for me, equity means you're going to be intentional about ensuring that my, my portion of whatever it is needed will give me an opportunity to, in fact, be equal. You have to give me at least years of um, opportunity in order for me to even be, even be equal with my white counterparts. And um, that would take us into the whole conversation about white privilege, which we're not here to talk about. But that's part of um, why I don't use the word equal. So in so, keeping with that understanding of words, you know, there, there's other words that people use and we use them interchangeably. But keeping with the word justice, what is righteousness and how does it different from different from justice? You know, justice comes from a point of... Um, natural fairness, and it's just that simple, natural fairness from a human perspective. Righteousness comes from a biblical um, term, which is more spiritual, and it talks about um, moral compass. And what do we see as morally right and upright? And uh, for those folk who have a relationship with God, however you serve God, you, you get what I'm saying. Now, there are people who don't believe in God. It does not mean that they don't have some level of righteousness because the way that we are reared, the way that we are um, brought up in our family determines a lot about who we are. 
the things that we experience in our lifestyle, uh, whether it's through um, the educational system or through our friendships, has a lot to do with how we evolve as human beings. But as a human being, we have a responsibility to treat each other in a way that's not only equal, as you said, but accepting. Beyond tolerance, accepting. My belief is that when we meet people just where they are, we are walking in the spirit of righteousness. And we have to imagine this. Jesus Christ, who made a decision to come to this earth in the embodiment of a human being, to go through all of the experiences that we will go through, all the hurts, all the harms, all the tears, sweat, and shedding of blood, was the most righteous human being because he was, in fact, deity. And he was murdered. He was crucified. And when you understand how he walked in those 33 years on this earth and how he was treated, it helps us stay grounded in the fact that, as the word says, we're going to be persecuted for his namesake. If he was persecuted, why aren't we going to be persecuted? And I found it is true. The more you do what is right, the more you are walking in the spirit of righteousness, the more you desire to be good and caring, there's going to be a level of spiritual darkness that's going to come at you to try to tear you down. But we have to know that we know that we have a responsibility, no matter what anybody says or does, to do what is right and right. Let me ask you a question, a very quick question. It may not be a quick answer because I'm sure many, many people have pondered this. Before I turn it over to Rashawn, um, when we talk about righteousness and justice and we see that justice is blind, is that because justice is blind? That's why we say that in your opinion. How do you, how do you distinguish doing things in the name of justice when you feel that you're being righteous? Well, I don't do things in the name of justice. I do things in the name of righteousness, quite frankly, because justice is, as I said, um, from a human perspective, and it's a system. This system has never been just towards black and brown people. Never. So I, I struggle in this movement to create a just system, which is why I use the term um, fighting for justice, because right now the system is not just. And I don't believe that the system will ever be just until we dismantle, dismantle we a system. We have to have a conversation on that. Yeah, we do. Until we dismantle I'm sorry, a system, can you repeat that again? Mm -hmm. I said, I, I struggle in this movement to create justice because the system has never been just for black and brown people. So I work every single day to find ways to dismantle a system that has never worked for black and brown people. And I do not believe it will be a just system until we dismantle it. And that's going to take all of us. All of us who are walking in the spirit of righteousness through the moral compass of what is right for all human beings. Understanding that we all want the same good quality of life. And we all want to be treated fairly. And then we get equally. So, you know, I know that um, we need to come back to that whole dismantling conversation because... When people hear that, they get fearful, and fear causes people to react in a very negative way and recoil and start becoming very tribal in nature. But before mm -hmm. we go there, there's tribes of people that, that sometimes aren't part of the voice. And I know Rashawn has a question that you wanted to ask you regarding the poor. Rashawn, do you want to ask Reverend Mack anything? Yes. Um, with all that's going on, when discussing the poor, how do you see our leaders helping to ensure the poor have access to justice or righteousness um, as an equal gender and equal rights in respect to society? Um, what do you think that we should do um, as leaders to make this happen? Well, it depends, Rashawn, that was a good question. It depends on which leader you're talking about. I think that we all have a, a, a responsibility to help those who, um, who are poor, who have less than what we have. Because most time, um, those who are living in poverty, it's generational poverty, right? Going back to systems that harm 
And so I think the politicians who we elected to always have a specific responsibility to put policies in place that are going to elevate the social economics of the people who need help the most. That's not happening. At least it's not happening the way that it needs to happen and it's not happening, happening quickly enough. In Charlotte in particular, we've done a five year study on poverty, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even millions on poverty while the impoverished stay in poverty. Does that make, make any sense? Absolutely not. We have people in the city of Charlotte, um, regular people like myself and everyone here who simply wanna help and we give of our own dollars to try to help folks. And sometimes we give and we give and we give and we don't see a change because the way in which we're giving is not structured. We have to have a plan, a real strategic plan in order to make sure we pull people out of the miry clay is how I put it. When I think about what's possible, the possibilities, I think of the Black Wall Street. I think of Tulsa, Oklahoma and how black people came together and built their own city. How that city flourished and everyone in the city was doing well. There was no one in the city who was impoverished because everyone worked together. And there was a mantra, each one teach one. Even back then, if I don't have what I have, you have. And that's how I try to live my life. The foundation of love, because love is an action word. So we give when we see people don't have, however we can give to meet that need. If we all began to do that, instead of the contrast that we see, the spirit of hate and division, and hurt and harm, we would be a different country. Look, I was born and raised here, so I love this country as much as anyone else, but I don't love the system of this country. And you see I'm wearing my Africa earrings because I'm of African descent, proudly of African descent. And so I'm trying to mesh the two, my pride in being from Africa, because remember the first man was from Africa, we're all descendants of the first man, for those of you who don't know that. So we are all kindred, we're all brethren. And when we get that, when we understand that and receive that and realize that there's no one race superior to the other race, we're all gonna be better for it. Powerful. Wow, um, very powerful. I work with a lot of youth and we try to encourage advocacy early. Um, when we create advocacy in teenage spaces or youth spaces, um, how can we advocate for equal treatment and help the future generations have more love, as you said, or not be discriminated against? Um, I, you know, I'm proud of this branch because we have quite a few youth chapters that we've started. We have three college chapters now and five um, high school chapters. And I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you that there was a time when I just didn't understand the youth. I'm like, they are crazy. But, then, you know, I started listening. So I'm going to say this. I found that the most important part of the conversation is listening. When you begin to listen to our youth, you not only hear their desires, you hear their pain. And there's so many youth who are going through deep, deep trauma in their households and in their communities and don't have anyone to tell them, I love you. Some have even said to me, the first time I told them I love them, you know, stop clowning me. You don't love me, you don't know me. And I have to keep saying over and over, I love you. I love you because you are me and I am you. And I really believe that when we begin to pour into people and free ourselves, free our hearts. We can touch our youth in special ways because I believe our youth are the leaders of today. We can talk about tomorrow. No, they are leaders of today. They simply need someone to pour into their lives. Allow them to glean from you. Don't be afraid or, or of them competing with you because that's another thing. And so there's two things that, three things that need to happen. The first thing is a self-examination. Prepare your own heart and mind. Get your own self clean so that when you go into these spaces speaking to our youth, you're speaking from a, an authentic space, a truthful place. 
and they will receive you. Trust me, they discern when, when you know, you, you're fake and you're phony and they despise that. And so just be honest with them, be transparent with them, and just begin to pour in the, into them the things that they say that they actually need. Give them the tools to survive this really hateful world right now. That's what my suggestion is. You know, we have um, several people on the, on the call here, and if they have any questions, now's the time to place it in chat or to raise your hand and I'll let you speak. But uh, if I don't, I'm not seeing any questions at this time. I know we have some leaders in our community on the call. Uh, they may be bashful, which I doubt it. But um, in any case, I, I'd like, Rashawn, do you have another question in the meantime while somebody uh, think ponders on the call? Uh, relating to, to kids, to students, to, to the education system. Um, I actually honestly want to know what you're reading these days. Yeah. Oh, well, um, I just finished reading um, White Frailty <laughs> just recently. Uh, I read the word every single day. Um, I have to just remind myself of who, I, who and whose I am because um, the day-to-day work that we do can get you thrown off and uh, have us do things and say things that we wish we hadn't said and, and done, right? So I try to stay grounded now more than ever before. Um, I am going to go back and read um, some of the tenets of faith because I didn't get a chance to tell some of you, you know, where I come from in terms of my beliefs. Born and raised in Harlem, USA, number 12 of 13 children. Uh, having seven older brothers, of which my, my closest older brother, Richard, um, really poured into my life about um, the Black Panthers and um, Garveyism and all those things. And where he went, I went. I was a real tomboy as a young girl. And, you know, just really began to realize who I was very young. And I was blessed to attend a private school called the Dalton School um, in New York City, um, starting in the fourth grade, being one of 10 Black um, students in the school of over 3,000 um, 3, very wealthy white folks, white and Jewish folks, and experienced uh, racism in the fourth grade for the first time. And so I understood very clearly on, early on that it was my responsibility to be an example for my community, which is a lot of pressure for a person in fourth grade. Uh, my mom would tell me, don't go to school fighting, don't go beating anybody up, don't, don't be clowning, don't embarrass me. Um, and, you know, you're, you're actually going to be the person who depicts who we are, because some people may, be, may have never, ever met a Black person, and it was true. And so when they took, um, we were learning about the Cro-Magnon Man in fourth grade, they took the picture and put it on the girl's bathroom with my name on it, okay? So I took the picture off the door and brought it into the classroom, and I asked everybody, who did it? Who did it? You know, holding back tears, and the teacher says, oh my God, who did this, who did this? And my response was, I want you to look at this picture. First of all, look at the complexion, that's not me. Look at the thin lips, that's not me. Look at the hair, that's not me. That looks more like you. I said, and because I'm a Christian, I don't even believe this. I believe that we're made in God's image, which means we're all beautiful. All of us are beautiful, no matter how wide or thin our nostrils may be, how thin or how curly our hair may be, how light or dark our pigmentation may be. We're made in God's image, and if you believe in God, we're all beautiful. And the two girls who did it began to weep, okay? And the teacher asked me, would I forgive them? I said, I don't forgive. God forgives. But I accept their apology, though. That was the first day I was able to make friends in that classroom because people understood that I was not some strange being from outer space. I was not some evil demon. And that's a whole nother story. You know, when someone told me that they heard that we black folks at midnight grew tails and scales. Like when I tell you, I went through it and had to walk in grace, even though I was in deep pain and hurt. And that's at four years old. So, you know, I'm trying to navigate this thing based on what my mother tells me without embarrassing my family and my entire heritage. So 
Reverend Mack, we have a question from uh, Princess Howell. I don't know if you know her, but her question is, do you think the Black community is capable of rallying resources today the same as the participants of Black Wall Street? I thought that that question, there are many questions coming through, but that one goes back to what we were just talking about, empowerment. So can you answer that question for her? I do. I, th I think that there are enough wealthy Black people who could pull their monies together uh, with a strategic plan and build many Black Wall Streets. I think that varies depending on the communities, because some communities are wealthier than others. But I think the, the, the bigger issue is, uh, and I'm going to be very transparent, I think the Black people have emulated and assimilated into Western civilization so deeply and have such a deep desire to be accepted that there's a level of self-hatred in the Black community. And when you hate yourself, you hate those who look like you. And so you see more the competition and more undermining and hurt and vitriolic language used against people who look like myself more than you see embracing and love and cherish and uplifting and elevating. And I'm hoping that that changes. Uh, we had a meeting last night and that was the whole conversation. What does love look like? like? Mm. What does it mean to be safe? I'm sure that was a very um, deep and empowering conversation because the word love we take it for granted, but that that's that that's a powerful word, an action word, as you said. You know, another question comes from a Latina because a lot of people think that the NAACP is only for African Americans, and it's not. It includes everyone. Um, a Latina wants to know. Her name is Carolina. Uh, she's one of our transformational leaders and leads the the module on finance. I'm giving her the plug because she's here and she made time to be here to listen to you. Um, her question is, I feel minority communities are working in silos. How can we better connect and come together to address the issues that affect all our communities? I'm going to talk about Charlotte because I think that it's important that we focus on where we all live, okay? One of the main reasons why we work on, in silos is, the, is um, Two reasons. First, uh, money and the lack thereof. And so everyone's running after the same grant opportunities, right? The second reason is that there's a lack of trust. And my suggestion is this, that we at least take the time to converse with one another um, and drop some of those barriers that we put up. Look, coming from Harlem, you know, um, Spanish Harlem was right down the block. At one point, I even lived there. We would go to the El Barrio and, and shoot the breeze. You know, my, my first best friend was a Latina, um, was a Puerto Rican. And so we understood that we were so interconnected. There was such a deep love. And we were young kids. And as we grew older, we, we grew apart. And I often think about that, that even now, not only are there silos amongst Black organizations, but there's definitely a, a division between Black and Brown people and Indigenous people. And we would be so powerful if we would just get in a room and have a real conversation about the things that we have um, commonality in. How powerful could we be, whether it's through the political arena in a voting block, or anything else we desired, if we came together, we would be unstoppable. You know, um, there's a question here, and, and I have. Uh, being in the leadership space, I'm always thinking about how do you prepare the next generation of leaders? I want to ask you the question, what are the roles, if any, that teachers and schools can play in tackling the issues of social inequities or inequality? How can they better prepare our children, the future leaders of this country, the city, the state, uh, in this capacity? Um, in my opinion, there's no way a teacher can be effective unless they first deal with their implicit bias mm -hmm. and their bias. And I think the educational system is being resegregated now as we speak. And that's because we have the wrong folks teaching our children. I think that the education system is the most powerful system um, today because they have our most precious gift in their midst for eight hours a day. And that's our children. So in my mind, if they could do away with implicit bias, bias and bigotry in the educational system, 
and begin to teach our children not only uh, you know, math and science and English, but cultural understanding. I'm talking about dig deep in all the cultures. Leave that white su superiority someplace else. There's no place for it. And begin to see our children as the bright shining stars that they are, we would have an effective country. We would have children who will grow into well-rounded and healed adults because people are walking around with trauma every single day. And then we would have, you know, the, the place of, um, I guess, first place in terms of academia in the world because we're not there. I think we're number 17 right now. Yeah. Nothing to be proud of. So a lot of work to do. You know, there, there's a person that, that, that I know, Alonzo Hill is with us today. He is a, he calls himself a food enthusiast. He helped my son and myself help go through food changes, understanding nutrition for a healthy tomorrow. His question for you is Congressman Warnock and Cory Booker are pushing an, um, an initiative for Black farmers and how do we empower the farmers to produce local foods and herbs well I, so he, I he's always talking about the core going back to the basics how do we feed our people the proper mm -hmm. nutrition well i mean i love Corey. he's a he's a well you said Corey bush or Corey booker Corey booker well, Corey Booker is a good friend of mine because we have a Corey Bush now, who I love too, but <laughs> female. But Corey Booker is a, is a friend of mine. He's a wonderful human being, one of the people who really began um, the conversation around criminal justice uh, reform as well. <clears throat> um, black farmers have been farming uh, for over 400 years and had many of their farms stolen through white supremacy. Well, let's start there. We... Black people have an agricultural knack. And I think that it's important that however they decide to push for um, Black farmers is a good thing. Black and Latino farmers, because um, I don't know if folks here know about Flock, but we have mm -hmm. Latino farmers who have been treated so horribly um, right here in the state of North Carolina that we have to support mm -hmm. and uplift. And as a unionist, you know, we were really engaged in trying to help them gain um, not only um, good wages, but good living conditions as well. Um, it's important that we use every aspect of government to give federal dollars to farmers. Folks probably know already, but um, Black uh, farmers lost more in the last 10 years than any other um, area um, uh, in terms of ownership due to climate environmental change, as well as some of the, um, the different laws and, and um, policies put in place. And I think a lot of this stuff is intentional. I really do think it's, it's intentional. That's just me, and you may want to call me a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> but I really believe that whatever Black people do well, there's something to always implement that pushes them back another 10, 20 steps. And so yeah. for Corey and, and for um, Pastor Warnock to be engaged, now Senator Warnock to be engaged and being intentional about looking at Black farmers and how do they uplift them, I'm all for it. You know, you just made Alonzo's day and several people I know have had additional questions that they'd like to ask you, Reverend Mack. I'll send them over to you and maybe you can answer them directly to them. We need to continue the conversation, but we're coming to the end of our program. But I do have one question to ask you. And it is looking towards the future. I'm always thinking about how do we propel people? How do we transform individuals? How can we collectively address the barriers each day that we face? What is just the top three things that we all can walk away with and know what to do? The barriers that we face. I think the first thing I said, I said it earlier, the first thing mm -hmm. we have to do is have a self-examination. Could someone share my email um, in the chat while I'm speaking? Um, so everyone has it. The self-examination is the first part of anything. We have to be right um, in our hearts and in our minds. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we have to be open-minded and be willing to go into, into rooms that we normally would not go into and be willing to um, be authentic in those rooms. 
the third thing is that we have to um, work collaboratively to have this country and this government acknowledge the wrong that was, has been done. There's no way we're going to um, actually have sustainable change until this country acknowledges the wrong that has been done and be, cons be consistent and in intentional about cr creating that change. And we call it restorative justice, right? I don't care what we call it, as long as we get there. Because as a black woman, you know, now 63, going on 64 years old, you know, I'm always thinking about my mortality, whether I'm going to be here, like someone that I absolutely adored and respect, which is Martin Luther King. I don't know if I'll get there with you, but I do know that every day I spend my life pouring into the lives of people to ensure that I give it all before I leave here. And if I don't get there with you, I want to know that I know that I know that we're on the road of restorative justice. That means all of us have to begin to humble ourselves. None of us have all the answers and figure out in some room, some space, some safe space, how we're going to work together collectively and collaboratively. Oh. Oh. I don't know if there's much more to add to that, but I want to say from the bottom of my heart, Sean, thank you for being here with me and being the co-host. I don't know if you have any last words for Reverend Mack before we close this out. No, thank you so much for all you have done and poured into the community for so many years of giving of yourself. I appreciate you. Thank you. You know, Reverend Mack, I know that uh, we put your email on the in the in the chat. For those of you that know us, we also will share her website for the NAACP, the Charlotte Mecklenburg branch here. 53, please remind me the number. I don't have it in front of me anymore. 5376. 5376. Uh, NAACP has monthly meetings. They're virtual right now, but, you know, find out what's going on in your community. Get in touch with Reverend Mack. She is approachable. She's a, she's a fantastic leader in our community. And as Rashawn said, she pours of herself every day. So I want to thank you all for joining us here on Cloud Chats. Thank you, Corinne Mack, for being here with us. Thank you, Rashawn. Um, thank you. I would be remiss if I didn't just say this one moment, take this, this, this uh, liberty here. I hear a lot of people talking about Zoom fatigue. Uh, what we do at Leadership in the Clouds, we help people understand and navigate the clouds. We must prepare for the next normal. It is not the new normal. This is the way of life. Adaptability, flexibility, and having conversations on how to navigate is what we do with our clients. If you wish to know more how we navigate and prevent Zoom fatigue, call us. We're leadershipintheclouds.com. But you know where to find Pat Martinez or Rashawn Peak. We're always around. So I just want to leave you with that, those thoughts that, you know, self-care is very important. If you find that you are saying, I can't because I'm Zoom fatigued, remember the days when we used to pop into the car, go in the snow and the rain. I don't live in New York anymore, so the snow isn't my challenge, but the rain is, and my hair re reacts to the rain. I'm going from meeting to meeting. So before we used to say, you know, I am just full day of meetings. Now, your full day of Zoom, manage it. Take care of yourself. Think of you first. Keep your energy level up. Continue watching Cloud Chats. We'll be back in March. And I want to thank you again, Corinne Mack, Reverend Mack, for being with us today. You inspire me always. You keep us going. And thank you for all you do for our community. It's your leadership sometimes that keeps people understanding that we do need to collaborate. You are a woman of action but you're also a woman that keeps your word. We've seen you walking with Latinos when we were fighting for immigration rights. We saw you walking with Latinos when, we, when ICE was upon us. We saw you uh, walking with people of socioeconomic levels, different ones, fighting for the rights of people, civil rights, workers' rights. Continue doing what you're doing and may God always bless you. Thank you all for being on Cloud Chats. And as always, we'll see you in the clouds. And Rashawn will, will knock us out because she is the host right now. So goodbye, everyone. Thank you for being with us.